Yeah, is it left side or right side? Oh, did we do this last time? We did, exactly, this last time. I found there was a little letter. Oh, yes, there is. There right, where? there you go, it's left on the wire. Left wire, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just check. Has my head changed shape since the last time? <laughs> no, but you were sitting here. No, there. That's it, yeah. <laughs> good. Okay, well, um, I think I need to take a quick photo of you. Right, so, uh, ready to rock and roll? So, rock and roll. Welcome, uh, everybody, after our summer break. We're back in the studio and lovely to see you all again. So, we better tell everyone who's here. Hi, I'm Ian, Editor-in-Chief of Internet Retailing. Hi, I'm Jamie from Merrick from Salesforce. Hi, I'm Martin, Head of Research at RetailX. Lovely. So, last time we were together, Jamie, we were in the ever-glamorous San Francisco at Dreamforce. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a pretty good week, I thought, but it was a first time for you, so I'd be very interested to hear what you thought of the whole thing. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, we've done a, a video on this, which uh, I'll put the link in below, but it was absolutely mind-blowing. We've had one of those years, because, you know, we've run our conference for years, and our expo gets, you know, around five, 7,000 people, and our conference is about 1,000 people. So during the year, we've been to things like DMXCO, which had 50,000 people. And I thought, wow, that's it. I'm never going to see more retailers in one space. But 170,000 people, uh, it was absolutely mind-blowing. It's, it's hard when you first get there. The, I did this three years ago. It was my first time. And I got there having just been, you know, the company I work for acquired by Salesforce and landed on this different planet. Yeah. <laughs> and it felt very odd. You know, uh, the idea is that you work your way through it, you know, but there's a lot to work through. I it, sure it's you extraordinary. Found I mean, it wasn't just let's get in one place. I thought the focus on education was amazing, the way that people have trails and can learn. About 2,700 sessions, my app tells me, which is just extraordinary. I think the two things I had as a takeaway were firstly, the, the quality of execution. As someone who puts on events, I know how difficult this is. But Every corner, every room, every street, you know, was branded, had helpful people. So that was absolutely incredible. And the second thing that took me by surprise was the, you know, that sort of spirit or the heart, you know, inside a brand. It really did set itself apart from other multi-billion global corporations. So, hey, look, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And um, as I said, we've done a video on it, so we leave that. But I would be interested um, if any of our listeners want to drop thoughts on you know, what makes a successful event for them and, you know, what what is stand out in a world that has just so many events vying for our time. Well, don't forget, we've got this NRF is the next one in January, which I think is one of the oh, yes. big ones that's not associated to any one particular company, but there for all, the National Retail Federation. Yeah, of course, I would forget that. I mean, that was 35,000 deaths. Which I used to think days. was big, but... Absolutely. So it doesn't. I think what's slightly different there is because that's a more sort of commercial and educational event. You don't have that consistency of branding, of vision, of, of programming, but it is one great place to see all of the industry soup to nuts. And I think if you come from an e-commerce background, it's great to see all of the store security integration stuff that maybe we would normally see in an e-com event. So it's great. But we will be there, won't we? We will be there. Looking forward to it. Lots of stuff to see in the city. Lots. Well. So we'll be doing um, a restore tour. So if you're going to NRF, just drop us a note. It'd be good to meet up and chat. And equally, if there are people you want us to look at or scout around while we're in the Big Apple, then we are at your service. Like the Amazon four-star store that's out there, just launched last week or something in, York, in, in Spring Street, Soho. What a great place. We'll go and check it out. An interesting location in terms of, you know, you've got the Apple store nearby, uh, incredible luxury brands and pop-up stores, as well as that sort of more cheek by jowl retail feel. So interesting place. A lot of lot of things to contrast against one another. I would have thought. Yeah. So I think that'll be another excuse to spend time in Soho. Yes. <laughs> so speaking of time, uh, let's crack on. Now this episode, we're sort of thinking, pause, service, future, and when we were in San Francisco, we did a, a store tour. One of the places we went was a company called Zippin, a relatively new startup that's in the sort of posless, checkoutless space. So following on from uh, the disruption that Amazon Go, uh, you know, the sort of hen in the chicken, uh, the, no, the fox in the chicken coop, not the hen in the fox coop. Mm -hmm. So Amazon Go definitely set the fox amongst the pigeons, just to keep it the fox. 
There are a number of other places now offering checkoutless shopping. You were in Shanghai earlier in the year. You saw some things there. Yeah, there were some incredible examples of it, actually. And there are a number of different flavours of it, too, as well. I mean, I think that's, that's the interesting thing. So people are doing it in different ways. Um, Suning was doing facial recognition. So you literally would wander up to a store and you'd stand in front of this screen that had a camera above it and you would they would put your face onto that uh, screen and they would work out who you were and allow you to come in. So, again, a different way of doing it. Mm-hmm. And we, we saw all sorts of different varieties. So there was a, what I would describe as a walk-in vending machine outside the main Auchan, or one of the big Auchans. It was an Auchan-branded box, and in there you could go and buy, you know, chocolate and a bit of booze and some crisps and, you know, stuff, water and things like that. And you could be in and out of there, and then we saw one bloke go in and out of there within 11 seconds having bought a bottle of water. But that was more of a scan to go in, your, your mm-hmm. WeChat app, go in, take the product, and then scan it in the self-service sort of checkout area and then leave, as it were. So, you know, lots of different ways in which to do it, yes. as we saw out there, but but increasing in popularity. And, you know, even where people aren't making a fuss about checkoutless, the checkout is kind of fading into the background. I mean, when we went to the New Balance global flagship, mm. there wasn't a checkout. They were just nice staff with iPads Velcro to their hands. So even there, there's this idea of you're being served wherever you are rather than having to queue at a place of the till and a locked drawer and so on. So, I mean, I think the world is moving that way, but many, many different models, it But seems. that's the dream, though, isn't it? I mean, that's what people are saying they want. If we did some research with Sapien, they said that most people are using their mobiles in store anyway, yeah. you know, for researching and for comparing prices. But a good number, you know, 20-ish percent, yeah. are actually buying stuff in a store on their phone. So it feels like that's where the consumer is going anyway, so people are responding to that. Yes, and the phone is a private device that has its own facial recognition. So we're also touching on some important things around privacy, data, you know, who's got your face, who recognises it, who decides when it's locked, unlocked. And, you know, so there are some interesting questions around this, as well as things like, are you tied into a given app? Mm -hmm. So you may have a situation where you walk down what's left of the high street, firing up different apps outside to check in, check out, Is that really convenient for the customer? So, you know, some interesting questions coming up. But shall we um, just drop back on the conversation we had with the CEO of Zipin? So um, in the space of about 500 metres, there were two very different approaches. We had Standard Market, which had its technology approach to um, Check Atlas. But we were lucky to get some time with the CEO and founder, Krishna, of zip in so we visited them in their store which was when you say store it was a sort of uh, thrown up office with big air con running and people tapping away in the background and a demo store right at the front so he very kindly gave us some time and uh, we had a good chat with him so let, let's listen to what we said and then have a chat about that Krishna, thank you for joining us. You must be so busy. I think everybody's desperate to come into the store at the moment. So um, just tell us a little bit about Zipin and how you created it. Right, so this all started about four years ago. Uh, my wife calls me frantically you know, one day, evening when I was in office. We were new parents to our little one at the time. And she said, we're out of milk. And so on my way home, I decided to stop by our favorite grocery store, uh, Trader Joe's here, and to grab a gallon of milk. Weekday evening, I step in and I see long lines uh, at the checkout. There was no way I was going to go in, get a gallon of milk and wait five to ten minutes in the line. So I stepped out immediately, went to a convenience store, picked up some non-organic milk, which wasn't ideal, uh, and went home. And this got me thinking that there has to be a better way. And so I dug in some of the numbers and found that Americans collectively spend over 37 billion hours a year waiting in lines. Wow. And a big chunk of that is in grocery and you know retail checkout lines. So the opportunity was huge. Discussed with my co-founders and we started working on the problem. Long story short, we raised some money from investors and launched a concept store in downtown San Francisco. Great. So I get the concept, uh, removing that pain, uh, even though, of course, no one's going to buy chewing gum and National Enquirer when they're not stuck in a line. But having an idea and then developing the technology is a very big step. So tell us about the technology itself and how this sort of, what feels like digital shoplifting uh, happens 
without the shoplifting. Sure. So after a couple of, uh, you know, I would say failed attempts at solving the problem, you know, about two years ago, we narrowed down to this approach and we realized that completely eliminating the checkout, you know, through a frictionless experience is the only way to solve it. The way our technology works is that everybody who walks into the store checks in at the entrance, right? And just like Uber or Lyft, they already have an account uh, with us, and they check in at the entrance. And once they're in, we use cameras that are overhead cameras looking straight down to keep track of where everybody is in the store and what they're doing, which products they're picking up, which products they're putting back, and recognize the products and add them to their cart. If they pick something, then we add it to their virtual cart. And when they're done, they just simply leave the store. No need to scan anything, no waiting in lines. Their cart gets transferred over to our payment partner. We bill them, and the receipt is in the app. So there's no cunning sense on the shelf, no image recognition of the label I'm holding, and also on the checkout on the way out. I didn't do anything. I didn't touch anything. So all of that is managed by these top-down cameras. So we do actually use sensors on the shelf as well. So we use cameras overhead that recognize the product, and that information is confirmed by sensors on the shelf that recognize which shelf you know, something has been picked from, and that gives us very, very high accuracy. Uh, we experimented with only cameras, and that resulted in significant errors because customers can pick many different ways, and they could be picking products by occluding the cameras. And if the cameras can't see it, they can't recognize it, right? So we use two types of sensors to ensure high accuracy. And that's it. So everything's getting, getting added to your cart as you pick up from the shelf. If you don't like it, you can put back, put back on the wrong shelf. You know, everything is recognized by the system. And when you're done, you simply leave because the cameras know that you're leaving. You don't have to scan again to, to let the cameras know. So. so the format you've got here is quite a small format, and I guess that's for demonstration purposes. But how big a format could you cater for with this technology? So, so the format here is intentionally small because the, the complexity of the technology is in its ability to handle crowds. And so we wanted to demonstrate the ability to handle lots of people that are crammed together, because that's when the technology gets very complex and it can get confused. And so by creating a small store, we create the, we increase the probability that more people will be rubbing shoulders and are you know, tightly packed. And that kind of demonstrates this technology and efficacy of the tech to retailers, right? But once we've shown this here, to increase it in square footage is very easy. Just linearly keep adding more cameras. Once one camera knows how to uniquely identify people and hand over customers to the next camera, that's it. You can just scale this to any, any size store that you want. Even if people are wearing sombreros and long-sleeved blowing dresses, carrying carrier bags, you know, so I'm just thinking of all the situations where cameras could be fooled, um, you can even track with that sort of difficulty. Right, so, so over the last two years, we've trained our AI on all of the kinds of scenarios that we just talked about. And essentially more and more data makes the AI more perfect. It's not 100% accurate. So there will be some cases where you know, it may not actually be able to recognize accurately. For those cases, we actually have a human backup. So we'll always catch those cases and a remote human can aid the AI so that in those cases we can handle. Sombreros are fine, flowing dresses are fine, you know, big bags, everything's fine. Of course, if you if you want to carry like a 12-foot diameter umbrella with you <laughs> and block all the cameras, well, that's a different story. Yes. <laughs> now, retailers are investing a lot in cameras uh, for other things, um, face recognition, security, concierge, tracking, um, identifying where customers wanted in store. So is your solution going to be able to interact with existing retail capabilities, maybe even you know, blending the AI, the AI, or is this going to be a standalone monolithic system? So that's a great question. So let me answer it in two parts. The first is the, the way we design the system for interoperability. Everything is designed as web services behind the scenes. So each piece is easily, uh, you know, it can easily integrate it with retailers' existing systems. Everything from accounts, like, you know, the app can actually be the retailer's app. 
the supply chain systems in the back end can actually interface with the in-store systems that oh, we've right. developed. So everything is done through web services. Okay. The, the second part is specifically about face recognition and, and privacy. So when we designed our solution, we wanted to be the most privacy-friendly solution on the market. So the way we chose cameras, the way they are placed, because they look straight down, they never look at your face, right? And so we don't actually, we can't use that data for face recognition. Nobody else can either. And that was important because for a lot of customers in the US and even Western Europe, uh, privacy was a big concern. And we wanted to make sure this could be adopted quickly. So we chose a design that practically you can't see anybody's face with. Great. Now, I'm excited. I want to do it. Uh, what are the costs of this? Because cameras are relatively cheap. Shelf sensors less so, especially for a large, uh, a large footprint store. If, if I ring you up and say I just have to do it now, what what are the challenges of actually making this live in a store? Now? So, so we've designed the solution to be very easy to retrofit in an existing store. I would say an approximate cost, like all inclusive. Um, again, these numbers are for U.S. market with U.S. expenses, uh, labor expenses. I would say twenty five dollars a square foot for all the cameras and the hardware needed, plus the sensors and wires and installation, is what you would have to budget. Um, be slightly higher if it's a very small store, um, because there may be some like access control costs that are one time. For larger stores, it would be even less than $25 a square foot. Mm. So are we calling, are you calling, I should say, the POS being dead now? Is that, is that the end of the road for POS? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, obviously the POS as we know it, is is going to be gone in 10 to 15 years because I you know I imagine every store in the world would be checkout free irrespective of what it sells you think you think it'll work for everything luxury goods for example yes yeah, so, so, so the way the costs are uh, the hardware costs keep going down every year and we're expecting a, an order of magnitude cost drop in the in the deep learning inferencing side like in GPUs is what we use today which are expensive but people are building special purpose chips to, to do that faster. So we expect that the hardware cost will go, come down dramatically, right? So for every kind of store, this would be the norm because no customer, no, no shopper in the world would ever say, gee, I would like to, you know, uh, to, to wait in line for this, even if there aren't typically lines in that store, right? So everybody would want this. For luxury items, if you think about it, I mean, one of the big benefits of this technology is loss prevention. Like everybody who walks into the store checks in, right? So you know who they are and you know whether you want to allow them into the store or not. And when they grab something from the shelf, it's added to their card. They are going to get billed. And, you know, when they walk out, you know, so there's no way for them to really steal without taking stuff off the shelf. And if and once they do, it's actually added to their card. Uh, so in general, losses go down because of theft because of this technology. And so, I mean, for luxury items as well, check out as an experience, you know, will be completely uh, automated. But that said, I mean, we're not building this technology to be to make the store human free. It's checkout free, not human free, right? Yeah. We expect that as a re- net margins increase for retailers, they would reinvest that in better experiences mm-hmm. for their shoppers and drive Especially, higher sales. Uh, yeah. You know, in luxury, if you mm. think the fun of it is not the handing the over your platinum cards. Exactly. It's all about the wrapping, the imagining how wonderful you're going to look in it. Well, actually, so, it comes with a barrier. That credit card bit is a bit awkward, exactly. isn't it? So or may you, I right. take your payment? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just step Don't back. worry about it. But I love this idea of the move from check-in mm-hmm. uh, rather than check-out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel a, an article or a follow-up coming on this. This idea that you, know, you, you belong to the store, you've registered, you are involved, even if you're just browsing. So you know, if you think of the difficulty of getting customers to sign up to CRM programs right. to you say, hey, I'm here, sell at me. All of a sudden, you've got this rich data of who's in the store, what are they doing, what are they browsing, what didn't they buy? I mean, this could be a total goldmine of data. Well, I guess I suppose that was the integration you're talking about with other systems, making that information available back to the retailer as part of the Absolutely, service that you yeah. offer. Is that right? That's right. As a retailer, once you deploy this technology, you get access to very advanced analytics that were otherwise not possible in a physical store. Like imagine like an online store that knows who you know was actually on your store. Through cookies, they can track which products you clicked on, which ones you added to cart but then removed it. They had all this information. Physical stores never did. But for the first time, they can get that level of information for individual users. 
So, Krishna, uh, we can hear people arriving in the store. I said it was a hot ticket today. So um, just to, to wrap up, where, where are you taking this next? It's impressive so far, but, you know, there's a next step. What, what is that? Right, so we're, we're ready to deploy this technology. So we're in discussions with a number of retailers, and we are constantly talking to more. And our goal is to, to start deploying this in real stores around the world. Great. Look, Krishna, thanks so much for that. I appreciate you taking this time when everyone in San Francisco wants to chat with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So what what was your takeaway from that, Jamie? There were so many, actually, because there were quite a lot of uh, things that uh, are going to knock on from this. So, But my first one is there's a very big difference between the stores I mentioned to you before in China, let's say, in the format of the self-checkout compared to this format because the privacy issue is so... Mm. Uh, front of mind in the West as opposed to it seemingly being slightly less front of mind in in the East. So that Mm. facial recognition bit happened in China but didn't happen here and and he's very conscious of that and that's why he thinks is the way to go and he's obviously gone through a number of iterations to get to the solution that he wants to. But I like the idea of Everything wants to be convenient now, and we all want convenience. You know, the stories you read in every sort of weekend newspaper about people getting cross if they don't get something in a nanosecond kind of mm-hmm. thing. So for, for certain types of things like goods, you know, I bought a great bottle of water and it took me no t- time at all to do it. That's great. When it came to luxury, I mentioned that because it's a kind of thing that was top of my mind at the time we spoke to him. You know, the opportunity for enhanced service once that has that barrier of the card and the payment has always been taken away. I think that's... A really good opportunity for some some businesses, targeted marketing, cost savings, you know, yes. the, the ability to to not no longer have to use handheld scanners, perhaps putting goods out on the floor because they recognize automatically. I, I don't know exactly how it works, but Absolutely. there's all sorts of them. And it's interesting as well when you compare the steps to date. So, you know, in towns, we're pretty used now to self-checkout, mm. which was initially a great idea and then became a total pain when the checkout would tell you, I'm sorry, you haven't put it in the bagging area, or the weight wasn't quite right, so said it's not there, and you'd call someone over to check you're old enough to buy your bottle of Chambly or something. So that was quite annoying. <clears throat> and same with the uh, zappy guns where you'd go around and zap things and forget about them, you'd break it, the battery would go. So <laughs> Have you used one? I've never used one. I, I, I registered just to use one, and yeah. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I couldn't remember what I'd oh. zapped, I had to scroll oh. through, and I thought, maybe I'm actually stealing something, I'm going to be arrested. So, you know, they're not stress-free, Was I think, um, you know, what we've seen recently in some stores is that uh, they now no longer weigh things. They just zap it, and they have one person standing by to help, but I think they must have done an analysis that showed that the actual theft was actually quite low, whereas the annoyance of waiting around to be checked was quite high. Yeah. Uh, in France, uh, at Decathlon, you don't check out. You throw everything into a bucket, and it uses the RFID, and it says, fine, you can now fold your stuff and take it with you. You've just checked out. So I think that there are different checkouts that are you know, a function of the technology, but also the culture and people's approach to theft and loss and to what extent you're worried about that or not so. well krishna i mean he, he we asked him the question is it dead pos and he says in the format that it is today it's dead in yeah. 10 to 15 years i can't help thinking having seen this and seen some stuff in china that perhaps maybe it's going to be quicker than that but that's possibly you know notwithstanding yeah. the the complications and the setup and all that sort of stuff that retail is going to have to go through and also as we said we mentioned different store formats are going to require different solutions perhaps Absolutely and so right. One size does not fit all. And we've seen that in places like, you know, Rebecca Minkoff, where you don't have a checkout, but you can do so many things in the changing room from, you know, things being merchandised, ordering, get a glass of champagne. So there's a real concierge advisory service um, without the there's a me- mechanised trappings of payment. And, you know, we'd, we'd said that um, POS is going to move from point of sale to point of service. But I think that in some places, you don't even want service. So if you think about, um, you know, we're near King's Cross Station now, then the format of the stores is very open and wide. So shallow, wide stores where you just grab and go. You know, we had newspapers, they don't, seem, don't even bother taking your money now. They just throw the money in and off you go. So I think we'll, we will exactly, as you're saying, have some places that are service-free because I can't even be bothered to queue to get three items, just grab and go, mm-hmm. up to things that are incredibly high service, 
but it would be wrong, wouldn't it, sir or madam, to bother you with payment? <laughs> um, you know, let's just see how lovely you look in uh, this thirty thousand uh, pound necklace you're buying. So I, I think it's that just you've bought be, that you've just bought <laughs> as you walked in. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also looking forward to the data side. I mean, you mentioned AI, mm. which is uh, fascinating to see that having AI is no longer enough, but having well trained, domain specific, we've we've done all the mistakes and learning AI is becoming quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd love the idea. He said, look, you know, Jamie, you came in the store, you picked up the San Pellegrino, but you put it down and bought the, you know, Mountain Fizz instead. Why was that? Would you like to fill in a survey? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like anything else in retail, there's so much opportunity for learning. And, and, you know, not all of us are grasping it right now. I know it's difficult and all that sort of stuff. So this is going to be yet another one. But you know, for the for those who can master it, I mean, this is now meshing, really meshing physical and digital. Yeah. And, you know, that becomes pretty exciting, I would have thought, for a lot of retailers. Absolutely. And I think, again, you're from our store tours perspective, so much now is you have the surface experience, mm -hmm. but a lot is going on in the background. So it's going to be quite interesting just, you know, chatting to people about how they're developing their store estate. Mm -hmm. So, Martin, we released the uh, European Top 500 earlier in the year, which is available, of course, at internetretailing.net slash IREU. But you've been doing some looking at the developments in service and checkout as well. So just update us on your diggings on checkout. Right. So we measured online checkout. And so there's a lot of talk at the moment about stores becoming more seamless and cutting out barriers there, but there are still quite a few barriers on the website. And we were looking at things such as uh, guest checkout and particularly third-party service plugins like um, using your Twitter or Facebook profile or in some cases doing the whole checkout process with Apple Pay or with PayPal, things like that. And we're looking in some retail sectors at as having as high as 80% penetration in terms of the number of retailers that are doing that. Um, so I, I would say it's, which has been growing just in the background a little bit while we've all been focused on stores. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is about having the the purchase just under your thumb. So you've browsed, you found what you wanted, just let me get it if I need it. Um, and you know, if you think about the standard form to fill in, especially if you're a new customer, your know, name, surname, address is the same as billing. You know, try to type in card details can be a nightmare as well. So there's no wonder that people are going to payment services that span everything, or even just your know, one button sign in. So again, it does make you think a bit about privacy, the role of the mobile in particular, as well as who owns that customer's data and purchasing history. So some interesting things being uh, done there. And was there a variation across Europe? I mean, is is the UK ahead or behind on this? Or, you know, who's who's really working on this? There is some variation, but it's, it's not enough that we were focusing on it. Uh, it would be a few percent here and there. Whereas across sectors, we found a big difference. So sports stuff, clothing, even small ticket items like stationery, those were the sectors which had the highest penetration. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also interesting when you think about who's buying from your stores, if, let's say you're in the UK, you know, obviously a lot of people from the UK, but also a lot of people from outside. And, and I saw a stat the other day in the Times about how the US consumer spends about 12 billion or so on British websites annually. And, and the second biggest market is China at about five and a half billion. Mm. So it just says to you, you know, to your point about this payment side of it, particularly think about different consumers and how they all have different payment methods, you know, you kind of got to be on top of it. So it kind of makes a lot of sense what, That's right. what, the, what the report says. And there is a balance as well about offering um, a myriad of uh, options mm. without overwhelming the customer when, you know, each of us may have a dozen possible ones, but one or two favoured ones. So surfacing that in the design, making that fit the device and the time does mean that your payment is one of the key areas of taking uh, complexity out of transaction. I wonder if AI comes into that a bit more in the future as well, as in trying to work out the payment type that people want at that particular time, I don't know. Well, I think, um, you know, our research is ongoing here, so uh, I think maybe we should just 
report back and uh, sounds like maybe the payment podcast is uh, is rearing its head. It, it's going to have to be done. But with all of this extra time we have available, now that we're not doing pause or checkout, we've also been looking at the response times from retailers to customers asking them things. So what insights do you have there? We've noticed in previous years that there's been a big difference in terms of median response time, depending on which channel the consumer is asking the question to the retailer through. And we noticed the the big lag here was in email, where the retailer would often take a few days to respond. So we've been testing that. And actually, there hadn't been too much change until this past year, where it seems like they all changed together. So we, we had a big shifts of a median time going from over 20 hours to just about 15. In some cases, we've got shifts of 24, 36 hours in terms of median response time for a sector. So what we're seeing is it, it, the email and web chat becoming more like live chat in terms of its responsiveness, more like Facebook chat other systems which retailers are already using to respond to customers. Hmm. Now, one of the things we discussed on this was that if you complain publicly, there's an incentive to Mm -hmm. respond publicly because everyone can see it was email queries are private, so no one knows you've complained, but they also tend to be longer and more complex, you know, maybe reciting uh, three months' worth of happiness or unhappiness, uh, depending. So we are doing a lot more on the social side as well, aren't we, to look at uh, this move from question response to more of a conversation with the customer. Yes, yeah, so live chat is one of the things which has been more and more popular over the past few years. It's been increasing by a few percent across the board, really, in terms of the number of retailers that are rolling it out. And response times with that, well, we haven't benchmarked them during business hours are you know, basically instantaneous. So I think perhaps that is driving the change in, in other channels such as email. Great. Well, look, there's uh, more on this. And uh, as Martin and the team are working through uh, investigations and deep dives into things that interest them, we are putting out the charts and stats on a regular basis. So if you don't already follow us on Twitter shock horror. We're at eTail for the Internet Retailing Top 500 and Martin's musings are on at RetailX where you can see the live stuff and uh, join us there to comment on those. So a good wander, San Francisco, China and back to the studio. So I feel I'm feeling global. But on the wandering front, uh, thanks to uh, help from the tech geniuses here who have managed to clean up our travelling audio, we are now emboldened to go where many podcasters have gone before, which is out into the field. So we're back in the studio on 30th of October with a couple of retail guests. So we're looking forward to that. But we are also willing to come to you. So have microphone, we'll travel. So we've got some store visits lined up and some meetings with boards and people around the place. So if you'd like to host us, uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, Equally, if you'd like to come and share some thoughts on a topic close to your heart or volunteer somebody to be on the show, then do let us know. We're all ears and uh, look forward to hearing from you. But in the meantime, from the studio, uh, we wish you a good month and we'll catch up with you very soon. Nice, job done. Very good. How long was that? 34 minutes. Wow. Lovely. Flew by in no time. (laughs) <laughs> we can just walk out now. That and actually, no, we do have to pay the bill. <laughs> just wondering if any of these microphones are out. safe to drop. <laughs> no, that's a boom. Let's not drop their microphones. We need one just for the photo.